So how the hell did I get here from there? And I'm not from New York, New York, Manhattan. I'm from this tiny little town you've never heard of. And standing up on a stage in Berlin speaking to bartenders, when Angus and I talked about this, I said, I don't know what I have to share that's valuable, but I'll do my best because uh, if there's one thing I've learned is everything I know that's awesome didn't come from me. I just learned it from other people. In fact, that's really the main reason I'm on the stage, apparently. As Angus told me, I put a post on Facebook a couple years ago called 58 Things I Learned About Bartending. And it got a couple hundred shares in a few hours. It was a very popular post. Don't be too impressed by that. This is a picture. Whoop. Put that one back. Yeah. Hang on. Sorry about that. This is a picture I put up that got over a thousand likes of a blood moon that I said was taken in my hometown of Las Vegas, where we don't have an ocean. And there's a sun rising behind it, and the moon is giant, and the moon is in front of the clouds. So don't give too much credit to things that end up online. But some of the things that were on there included the weeds always start with one drink, and probably my favorite, if you're not having fun behind the bar, you're not taking your job seriously enough. That's from an anonymous bartender in DC. So he asked if I'd come up here and share things, not just about bartending, but whatever it is that I've learned that's helped me in my career get where I am that maybe has some value to you. And the real reason I think I'm up here, and my first bit of advice is try not to die. Uh, being old helps. The older you are and the longer you do things, the more important people think you are and the wiser they think you are, even if you're not, like me. So um, now you're laughing in your head or wondering like, uh, I don't get it. I said in the presentation title that I am the clumsiest bartender to ever live. Does anyone want to perhaps argue with that and think that they're just as clumsy as I am? You're not, I promise. Exhibit A. So the year is 1996, and I'm working for what is at the tail end of a very famous company that no longer is, TGI Fridays, and I'm traveling around the country opening up stores for them, and I'm at a new flagship two-level store in Washington, D.C. It's the first time I've ever opened, though, a big brand new restaurant where everything's new and shiny. And we expect this giant crowd, and there's no one in there. But as we've set up, does everyone, do you know what this is? Check spike, do you put the chits on service bar? Do you know what, how they come when they're new? They have a little white rubber cap on the top that you have to take off, which I didn't know. And when you take it off, you discover that the spike, when it's new, is extremely sharp. So I'm telling this story, because there's no one in the building, to my staff, and as I'm telling, I get all animated, and then I say, and you will not believe What happened? Now, my coworkers thought I was kidding and that I was just holding it on the side, so I had to show them that it did actually sever into my hand and go right through my hand. And then I had to head off to the hospital where I found out that it was about a millimeter away from a nerve and I would have passed out. So we took it out and of course, I went back to work. Why wouldn't you? But if you notice, I definitely made sure to take the time to stop and take a photo of it. This is pre-smartphone, so we had a camera out with film, if you can believe it. And that's my second bit of advice. If you're gonna laugh about it someday, you might as well start now. And that is so true in anything, because in this industry, we're all about thriving under stress and pressure, more so than anything I've ever done. But if you can't find the fun in that stress and pressure, maybe you find someone that you know in a kitchen or wherever they are, behind the bar, you all have that coworker or that friend, that person who's like laughing when you're in the weeds, like thinks that everything is fun and funny. Buy them a drink, sit down and see how their crazy brain works and what makes that work. My, uh, as you notice too, I'm, I'm in my mid to late 20s here. Um, one of the things that makes me wonder how the hell I ever got here, I first started making my dad's gin and tonics when I was 10 years old. I threw my first illegal party in my mom's backyard at the age of 15 in high school. That's me at 15, not seven, 
even though it looks like it. And I know what you're thinking, well, you're probably just a late bloomer. You'd be wrong. That is me my first year of bartending. That is me at 18 years old. Needless to say, it was not that easy getting a bartending job. In fact, I heard no a whopping 30 times. I went out to get a bartending job. I got literally laughed at when I walked into bars. They looked at me and said, you want to bartend in? It didn't upset me because I also had the good fortune of having a sales trainer who happened to be one of the best in the country for another job I had because I always had two or three jobs. And he told me something that always stuck with me, which was that really it's always just statistics. Whatever it is that you want, it's all just statistics. So how many people in here want to open their own, own their own bar one day? Anyone in here want to own a bar? Don't be shy, admit it. You crazy motherfuckers. All right, so you want to own a bar. Anyone wants to be a brand ambassador or launch their own product or their own spirit? How many times have you asked for that dream to come true, the people that can make it happen? I learned that in sales, the average person, salesperson, asks for an order twice. The problem is the average human does not say yes to the order until the fifth try. So most people that are selling just give up too soon. I was a persistent little bugger. So I knew and got excited every time I heard no when I asked for that bartending job because I knew it was just a numbers game. And the more no's I heard, the closer I was to yes. When you make those mental flips, because it's so natural to be rejected and feel bad, embrace the freak inside of you and be excited to hear no because you know in business, you know that eventually if you keep asking and listening and modifying what you're telling people to give them what they want, you're going to get the yes. So despite all this clumsiness and looking so young, I did manage to scratch out a career, because I'm sure most of you have no idea who the hell I am, to scratch out a career that impresses my mom. Uh, like this one, for example, is one of my favorite, the six national and international bartending titles. At least three of those are legitimate. I'm just going to let you know right now. And they weren't voting competitions. And then eventually, I also did this. Somebody clap and make me feel better, please. Thank you. Oh, stop. Your toe. Oh, cut it out. Knock it off. Uh, and now, right now, today, most importantly, I am here with you. All of you. So what I'd like to do today, what I'm hoping in this hour, is that each and every one of you will walk away with one new idea something that I spark, maybe a light of fire for something you've always wanted to do or you're trying to work on now, and if nothing else, give you at least one laugh, especially apparently if you are a naked, bald guy. So the first thing I want to talk about is innovation. Um, innovation's funny if you think about it, because really what's behind being an innovator is telling the world, um, so there's been billions and billions and billions of you, but I thought of something that none of you thought of and made it happen. That's a pretty crazy thought to have in your head, that you're the first person to actually think of something. Or worse, the other kind of innovation is the kind of person who says, you know that thing that we're all sure is true? I, I think it's wrong. I'm pretty sure we're all doing it wrong. Innovation is lonely. So if you want to do something different, if you want to disrupt an industry, if you want to change the world, just realize for a while it's not a popularity contest. You're probably going to be pretty lonely. There was a time when we were sure as a species that our planet was flat. Common knowledge. Everyone knew it. And then at one point, someone, we think Pythagoras, but probably not, but a Greek probably, set out to show that, no, I actually think that's, that's wrong. The earth is not flat. It's in fact a ball. And now today we all accept that. Of course it's round. Except for these cheeky bastards. I don't know if you can read that right there. Take a second to read that, sir, your phone, really. Uh, right here. In fact, we know when we look at uh, really about the innovation technology cycle, we know that, for example, when you bring out a new idea, only 2.5% of the people are going to believe or listen to you at first, which means right now in this room, when I bring up an idea, which I'm about to, 
there's a good chance that there's going to be like one or two people in this room that are like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And everyone else is going to be like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? That makes no sense at all. The people who innovate are not daunted by that. Creativity. Um, how many people do most of their work on a phone, an iPad, or a laptop? Be honest and show your hand. Okay. How many people do most of their initial ideation and work with a pencil and paper or an iPad with a pencil? Yeah, awesome. One of the ideas of sketch as fast as you think is once we rely, when I do it, when I start relying on technology, whether it's AutoCAD or Photoshop or Keynote or anything, it tends to limit you're thinking quite a bit because you're spending time with the constraints of the tech. And you're trying to think about how to use the tech instead of just developing the idea. Most great thinkers, most people who design and build things that are amazing that we all love, you would not probably believe their sketches. For example, does anyone know what that's a sketch of? I'd love to take credit for that, but I can't. That is a sketch from who, who is probably, arguably, the most famous living architect in the world right now of the Guggenheim in Spain. That is his first sketch. That's not a joke. That's how he thinks and draws. The idea you have that you may not be able to articulate, because I've heard this all the time, well, I can't draw. I'm not a good artist. Everyone is a good artist. Draw your idea down, write it, sketch it, as long as you can read it or you understand it, that's what matters. Because now, once you do a drawing in 10 seconds of what's in your head, you can iterate much faster and get to the gold quicker. Also remember that color cannot save a bad idea, which I do not, the irony is not lost on me that that's not a really bright, colorful slide. Uh, I spent time in advertising as an art director and a copywriter, and one of the things I was taught was all great ideas are great in black and white on a piece of paper. If you need color to make the idea sellable, to present it, to make people excited, it might not be a great idea. So always save color for last. And another little trick that I learned in advertising is when you think you've got a concept, particularly if it's something visual, print it out on actual paper, if we still have that in our offices and homes, tape it up on a wall, not a wall you walk by all the time. Put it in a room you're not in that much. I do it in my house where my studio is. I put it in a spare bedroom. And I have this brilliant idea. And I put it on the wall. And I come back three days later. And most of the time I walk back and I go, that is absolute shit. How did I think of that? But usually there's a piece of gold in it. Before you get too excited about an idea that you're sure is great, give it time. Let the emotion leave and look back at it with a fresh set of eyes. And then lastly on creative, um, Zoning out. I notice that a lot of people focus, at least in America, on being productive and productivity. Lots of meetings, lots of things that have to be accomplished. But then they want brand new bold ideas. At least for me, all the great ideas come at the times that I am turning my brain off as much as possible and I'm allowing myself to think almost in the same way that we deep REM sleep and dream. When you're in REM sleep, the part of your brain in the frontal lobe that shuts down is why you have the dream where you're hanging out with your mom having a coffee and then all of a sudden you're in a kayak made out of cucumbers but you're talking to Steven Tyler and you're on stage playing a keyboard in front of 60,000 people and it all makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense because your inner critic gets shut off. The person who goes, that doesn't make sense. You shouldn't do that. I don't know if that's a good idea. You might be embarrassed. People might make fun of you. That person goes off, and that's where you make new associations you would otherwise probably never make. So spend time. It sounds, sounds corny. Spend time. Schedule in time to dr daydream, to just think. If you like to think in the shower, the hot tub, while you're running, while you're driving, I wouldn't suggest driving. But make sure you're doing that because if someone says to you, for example, I asked Jeffrey Morgenthaler, that clever son of a bitch one time, to come and do an event and present a new creative idea. And he laughed and he said, that's not how creativity works. And I knew he was right. I was just hoping he could pull it out. But creativity is nonlinear. Here's a book I love, if you guys are readers, on the same subject. How many people are the head bartender, bar manager, or own a bar or a beverage director? Show of hands. So basically, you're a babysitter, and you spend all day unclogging toilets and finding out where deliveries are that didn't arrive and dealing with people's whining and crying and problems. So I, yeah, I manage three bars. I'm, yep, I'm with you. 
there is a, a, a cycle that I, it took me a while to become comfortable with. I am one of those people who sees problems as puzzles. And I do get excited when there's a new problem because that means there's a solution. Because when I hear problem, I think math's problem. It's math plurals. I think I'm the only American in here. So I don't have to explain that to you guys. Um, but I usually end up being very frustrated as I try to solve for that. And I, as I grew up and as I worked in bars and restaurants and with clients, the frustration was something that tended to bother people. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm not supposed to be frustrated. I think there's a point where you reach a balance and you realize that frustration is so important. Most artists are very frustrated people. So if you find yourself in that space where you're working on something and you're getting really frustrated and it's frustrating other people, just go isolate yourself. Frustration is good. If you can ride that balance back and forth between being excited to solve a problem and frustrated that you didn't have a great solution, you're in a good space. Another one is problem isolation. And this is something that I see in large-scaled organizations. I work with Starbucks and Hilton and IHG and all these companies. One of the things I noticed that a couple of them do very well and others don't is the way they go about isolating problems. So let's take a made up problem, for example. Let's say that someone came to me and said, uh, I need you to buy a new projector for this room. That's my problem. So what do we do? We rush out, we buy the best new, brand new projector. But is that the problem? What could the problem really be? And so I would go back and say, well, why do you want a new projector? What's the problem? Well, the problem is the projector isn't good enough. Well, what do you mean? Well, it's not bright enough on the screen. So the problem is that the screen isn't bright enough. Right. So the problem is people can't clearly see the screen. Correct. Well, now, instead of going out and spending 2,500 euro on a new projector, maybe we could spend 600 euro on a new screen or 150 euro on a light bulb. Or what else could we do? Dim the lights. You know, a lot of times, identifying a great solution is really about starting by identifying the true problem. And then for me, the next step, and I learned this from my programming days, I had a lot of careers. I'm like 507. Yoda and I were in school together is to enlarge the problem area. And this is one that I made the mistake a lot. And I don't know if you've made this same mistake, but when I was younger and doing beverage development and training bartenders, I'd come in, guns blazing, this is what we're gonna do and here's how we're gonna do it. Because this is great and I know everyone's gonna love it. And I spent so much time trying to fight against things I didn't understand like cultural shifts and getting buy-in because I didn't enlarge the problem area. And so for example, enlarging the problem area is basically just thinking about adjacencies. This is a great solution I have, but what happens when I plug it into a system? What do I affect? What do I change? When you roll in as a consultant or an ambassador to present new recipes to a staff, if you enlarge the problem area, what's the real problem with rolling out a new beverage program? What's the real problem? Nobody? Buy-in from the bartenders. Getting the bartenders to want to make those drinks, to accept that your drinks, that your recipes are going to be better for the bar, for them, or whatever. And so anytime you're looking at any problem, before you jump to the solution, I like to jump out. And then the last one is smoke a joint, and I did put that on a slide. Uh, only 15 grams in Berlin, apparently. Um, not that I know that. No, you can laugh, but I would say to you, again, find a way to shut off that logical brain once you have what you think is a very logical, smart, solution to allow yourself to have that creative thinking to really, people say, well, let's think outside the box. You can't think outside the box the same way you think inside the box. You can't be in a meeting talking about logistical top level and very low hanging fruit, very important systematic ideas, and then suddenly have an incredible inspiration. You actually have to understand your neurochemistry a little bit and how your brain works. So whether it's to get uh, by exercise, running, whatever you can do, you got to get out there into that weird headspace and allow yourself to ask crazy questions like, in the problem of the projector, well, what if we didn't have a projector? I worked in a room at Starbucks where we asked questions like, well, what if there wasn't gravity? And what I didn't know when they brought me into this, into this room and their skunk works was they ask those kind of questions early on with new people because they want to see their reaction. And the people that go, well, that's stupid. We have gravity. Those people don't last in that room. They get to leave. You only stay in the room when someone says, well, what if there's no gravity? And you start going, well, then I guess we got to figure out how to keep all of the glassware and the plates from floating around the room. And you start solving those weird problems. 
So give yourself that opportunity. That's a great book on thinking, uh, a different way to thinking. This is a magazine that's now digital, I think, that I grew up with. If you want to be good at problem solving or better at problem solving, you need to spend time solving problems and build that muscle. So whatever it is for you, crossword, Sudoku, doesn't matter, find something. All right, now let's get to one of the big ones. It's pretty ballsy, right? Getting up in front of a room of bartenders and telling them how to bartend. Yeah, whew, careful. Uh, one of my favorites is this one. Learn the drinks so that you can forget them. So you can focus on what's really important, people. Not just for that obvious reason, but whether or not you're aware of it, you all do it. You may not understand how your brain and your body works. Maybe you do. I didn't. Now I do. You have two types of memory, implicit and explicit. Your explicit memory is the one that really doesn't help you be faster. It just helps you in the moment. The implicit one is the one, it's what we call muscle memory or procedural memory. Everything you can possibly do that you can make automatic by consolidating the memory through the brain stem allows you to have the time to get your head up and look around the room. And I say this, if you find yourself now or in the next 35 minutes saying, yeah, I already know that, I'll just let you know that's a red flag for yourself. If you say to yourself, I already know that, I did this a lot when I was younger. I hopefully don't do it as much anymore. You're missing some of the real gold and the value that's trying to be communicated. So I'm going to deep dive now to take this obvious thought a step further. You don't have to put your hands up, but everybody knows bar or bars where they take Hawthorne strainers and they hang them on hooks, correct? You've seen this? Show of hands, who's seen this before? Very few people. Well, it's very big in America. I don't know who started it, but taking Hawthorns, a lot of them, and putting them on a little hook on the bar counter. The problem with that is the part of your brain that does tracking, which is searching for objects, is right here. It's your frontal lobe. This is that inner critic. It's what we need for decision making and higher thinking. Whenever you can't find something, even if it's by a couple of millimeters, if you miss an object, it turns on your frontal lobe. Your brain has to search for it. So now two things are happening that you don't want happening behind the bar. Number one, you can't listen to people because you can only process, the frontal lobe processes one thing at a time. You cannot be on your phone and be listening to someone with comprehension at the same time. Don't believe me? So I'm the only person who's gone into a grocery store, gotten a phone call, and walked around the grocery store for 35 minutes that not found a thing. If you're laughing, it's because you know it's true. That's because your brain cannot search for things that are new or not where you think they're supposed to be and comprehend language at the same time. However, if you have a schematic, if you know exactly where every object is, then you're fine. And that's the real reason why you're all OCD. That's the reason why you put every object in an exact spot, whether you knew it or not. So learning the drinks isn't just learning the recipes, it's learning the exact location and the order. And if you want to talk about competitions, for example, while I was never the fastest in competition, my closest friends were. One of my close friends you probably never heard of, his name is Ken Hall, did a complete round of drinks. They were not fancy cocktails, but they did include blender drinks. Six different drinks while 500 people watched in 46 seconds. Clean, no mistakes, perfect cocktails. And there's a lot of people that had this speed. The way Ken broke down drinks blew my mind. Everyone else was like, well, here's the daiquiri and here's this drink. This is 20 years ago, by the way. Ken's process was the first mechanic I do, there were no recipes. Here's the first, just like real bartending. It's just these bottles, these objects. John LaMare would appreciate this one and make fun of it. I do get asked a lot because I've trained a lot of bartenders. I want to be better at X. How do I get better? So I'm guessing in this room, maybe a lot of you want to be better at, let's just say, cocktails or mixology. 20 years ago, I had a lot of bartenders asking me, how can I be better at bottle flipping, at flair? And my answer was always the same. If you want to be better at flair, stop flaring. You want to be better at mixology, go pick up a shit in a dive bar. Don't bring your Japanese spoon. Don't bring your own ice. Don't bring your homemade tinctures and just bartend without any of those things that you normally rely on. And watch how many new things you learn that make you a stronger bartender so that when you go back to your strengths, you're that much more aware and able to do them better. You wanna be better at mixology? Go work in a nightclub. 
Here's a fancy one meant to try to impress you that I know big fancy words. This is the fancy scientific word for what we all know is being in the zone. How many people, has everyone in this room bartended? Show of hands who are or have been bartenders. My greatest love behind the bar, absolutely, I will admit it, was being in the zone making drinks. I love talking to people, but I love being in the shit, knee deep, nothing but asses and elbows, the printer's going off, people are all freaking out, and you're just in the service bar, just knocking drinks out. I love that physical feeling, and I loved when I dropped into the zone, just like in sports. That zone is called transient hypofrontality, and basically what it means is, in order to get to that place where your brain releases that slurry, that brain chemical cocktail with dopamine and all those other chemicals, you have to turn off the inner critic who is in the frontal lobe. And that's why, for example, there's a little tiny company that knew that and were very clever in their marketing. If you've ever had a coach that said, get out of your head, just, just, just shoot the ball, just do it. Just do it is transient hypofrontality. Stop thinking, it's leap before you look. Bartending's weird because you have to use higher reasoning, but you also want to be in the zone. So how do you stay in the zone? Well, for me, it was learning and figuring out the more I could get into the zone and the faster I could do it, when I had to pop out of it to have a conversation, to process things going on, the faster I could drop back into it. So for me, everything behind the bar was about how do I set this bar up? How do I build a team? How do we set up service so that I can have my bartenders be in the zone when it matters the most at peak volume. And I'll tell you the easiest solution in the world. And it blows my mind there aren't more of them. Back of house service bars. Here's an interesting thought that probably will make people mad. We all think and want and believe that we make most, it's, it's so important to focus on the cocktail. It is so important. Look at the temples to cocktails we've been building the last 10, 15 years. And, and I love them. You go in and it's mesmerizing. And they're all in front of the guest. I know, because of my hobbyist fascination with neuroscience, that it is impossible to have total and complete attention on something and something else at the same time. So if you want to make the most pristine, perfect cocktail possible, that means you really need to basically block everything out. And don't worry, we don't have any muggle folk in here, do we? Are there any day walkers? Is it just bartenders? They don't know our secret. They don't know that we're like, uh-huh. Yeah, oh, right on, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I don't hear you. I'm not listening to you. I'm up in my head with that list of 40 things I have to do, trying to take care of this entire staff. But the ability to just focus on that drink is absolutely affected by what's around me. So why don't we take the one station that does the most and put it somewhere where they can focus on it instead of, Here's your service bar, here's your 14 servers, and here's three guests, drunk guests screaming at you and tugging on your shirt. Hey, yo, yo, can I, hey, bartender, yo, hey. Like, and you're like, ah, can't you tell I'm busy? No, they can't, they don't care. Uh, I don't know if this is a problem over here. I don't know who started this. It's probably an old friend of mine. But in the U.S., there's a lot of shaking, and it looks like this. What the hell is on your shoes? Do you have recipes down there? Is there a little screen and you're looking at the front door? Get your head up. And as funny as that can be, finding, especially in training, triggers to give people to remind them on how to use their body and brain is something I've done in all my staff trainings. So I tell them that joke so that when the next time they automatically do it because it's procedural memory, they remember to get their head off their shoes and scan the room for information because that's where all the love is. It's all the fun, all the money, all the problems and the answers. They're all out in the eyeballs. They are not down on the shoes. Another example, one of my favorites, I know, I, I think you guys don't quite have the obsession with ice as we do in America, but if you've seen American bars, I mean, you know, our ice bins are like this. You ask most bartenders, I do this in every training, I tell everyone, in fact, let's do it real quick. Everybody just stand up. Just real quick, come on, get up, it's early, I know. He's like, oh, he's making me move. Okay, now, I want you guys to go ahead. Don't think what I'm trying to get to. Just be honest and real. Right now, just up a glass. Go ahead right now, the way you normally do it. Grab a glass and a scoop of your tongs and pantomime putting ice in a glass. Go ahead and do it. Don't lie. Be real. Okay, go ahead. Everyone do it. Oh, you're such a bunch of liars. Sit down. So 90% of the time when I do this, almost everyone in the class does the same thing. They drop their head into the ice while they scoop. And I say to them, why are you looking at your ice? I mean, do you think you're going to miss it? 
It's this fucking big. So I do that on purpose so that when they go back and do their demos while we're training, that's their trigger. They catch themselves looking at their ice, they break the synapse between stimulus and response, and they put a new habit in, which we're about to get to. The thing that I wish I saw more of, and I'm reading more articles about it, but I'm hoping we see it more and more, is realizing there's three levels of service if you want to be simple about it, right? Primary, secondary, and tertiary. You guys all know what primary and secondary are. Tertiary is just a fancy word for three. Third level service is very simple. It is what do people want that has absolutely nothing to do with the drink, the food, the building they're in right now. It's hard sometimes for hospitality staffs to remember that we are not the sun that the world revolves around, that we are just one little sliver of someone's day. Where are they in their day and what do they want besides that drink? Are they here to meet someone, to be left alone? Do they want to feel safe? Do they want to meet a stranger? Do they want to find directions? Whatever that is. And not just conversationally, what kind of mood are they in? Getting to the tertiary. The problem is you can't get to the tertiary without constantly returning to the primary service and the secondary. Because when you do, you have the bartender who sits in the corner having an amazing conversation with a guest for 45 minutes while the whole place goes down in flames and everyone else is picking up the slack. But getting to that tertiary is hard because you've got to constantly stay up on the service piece to be able to get to the hospitality. And in that vein, at least for me, my favorite analogy for what bartending really is, it's a reverse mullet. You guys know the mullet? Reverse mullet, right? It's party in the front, business in the back. And so when I set up events and when I'm working, I heard, it's funny, I had a friend tell me years ago, they said, you know, there's two Tobins. I'm like, okay, so you're saying I'm crazy? I already knew that. He said, no, there's the one when we're getting ready and it's nothing like the one that's out at parties and out when you're bartending. I'm like, right, because when I'm getting ready, I'm preparing for war because I want everything overstocked and set up for everyone working so that as much of a pain in the ass as it was for me to do that, when you walk into the room and the party starts, I can be fun. Because I can't be fun. How many people bartend but also are managers or owners? For me, maybe just because I wasn't great at it, that was the hardest struggle I ever had. How do I stay that fun bartender when I'm in my head going, Jesus, are they going to trash the bathroom? Oh my God, late to work again. Crap, that table 34 looks terrible. Where's my staff? And thinking about all the business problems instead of focusing on the hospitality. Here are three books that for me help me. I love thinking about how the brain works and figuring it out and then going, so what are the things I can show to staffs? How can I embed this into their workflows? They don't have to know about it. We don't have to try to be fancy. How can I leverage the best of human neuro neuroscience and neurochemistry and physiology to create the most incredible service possible? You guys all develop menus? Most of you? Show of hands? Is that a big thing? Kind of half? Okay. Occam's razor, basically, two well-thought-out solutions that both solve the problem that makes sense. The simplest one is preferred. And this comes down to the idea, as we know, of like there's a couple bars now that are working on the two ingredient menus, which I think is brilliant. Because I think it was Voltaire who said, perfection is not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. When you're designing drinks, I challenge you to see if you can pull an ingredient out rather than add one in. Now, when I had my staffs, one of the things I would always do is I noticed when they learned a new technique, whether it be something that's modernist and molecular, or it's cryovacking, or it's fat washing, or switching, or whatever it may be, you, as a human, we get so obsessed with figuring the technique out and getting good at it that we don't often stop to ask, why are we using the technique? And if that seems a little far-fetched, so that means you didn't go through this. You didn't first see a bartender take a peel of orange grab a match and produce a flamethrower and that didn't blow your mind and you didn't go home and try to figure it out? Of course you did. And then you went on the bar and what did every drink get for the next four months? Flamed orange zest! Pina colada, flamed orange zest! Without stopping and thinking, gosh, is burnt orange the right flavor for the top of a mar dry martini? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. 
So I'd always ask my staff when they get excited. I remember the first time it happened. I had a staff who had just learned from a very famous chef about 10 years ago how to do reverse spherification. And he came back with a drink that had these beautiful little pearls of red pepper. And I and it just said to him, I said, why? He said, well, because, I go, but why? Why do, do we want to put red pepper in a ball inside of someone's drink? And he got a little upset, but the lesson for all of us was the technique should be there to make the drink better. If not, why are you using it? Unless it's theater. Uh, another weird thing I like to do is ask how drinks die. So we, may, do you guys do this? Do you make a drink in drink development and then you time it and watch it die and taste it as it dies? Do you think about enlarging the problem area? When you design a drink for a client or a customer or a venue, do you think about the atmospheric environmental conditions? Are there bright lights? Is it outdoors? Is it hot? Is it humid? Maybe egg whites aren't the way to go for that foam or that drink. Maybe I have to go to agar agar or something else. I've got to change it so it'll be stabilized longer to last for the true service progression, which from the time you make the drink till the time it gets to someone's mouth, sadly, can be five or 10 minutes. And these are the three of my favorite books. This one was around long enough for me to take advantage of. Unfortunately, those two brilliant books came out much later. By the way, this one right here from Jeff Lee Morgenthaler, there is no better book on the planet if you've got a really short, wobbly coffee table leg. You just stick it right under there, never moves. Please make sure he knows I said that. Uh, so training uh, for me, finally got to a point where I realized all you're really doing is replacing habits. You're not breaking habits. Um, the brain cannot break a habit. You don't quit smoking, you stop smoking, <laughs> right? It's a very hard thing to do. What, what you end up doing is once your brain develops those neural pathways and myelinates them to create this strong conduit where electrical impulses say do this, it's extremely hard to break the wiring. All you can do is kind of put a detour and take it somewhere else. So in training, you're replacing habits. And I'll give you an example of one that's been very effective. There was a day when we all knew that the people that came through our doors were called guests. That has changed, at least in America, and now the word customer comes up a lot, which kind of makes me like, ah, customer. It's not a customer, it's a guest, like in my home. So I was trying to change the culture of a little company, Starbucks, the entire company, because they call the people that walk into their buildings customers. But I didn't want to insult anyone, and I had to figure out how to do this. So what I've used for years, and I used with them, is we have a conversation early on that says, hey guys, let's just try this. Uh, instead of the word customer, let's substitute it with guest, and I need your help with this for all of us. So what we're gonna do as a group, is anytime you hear one of your colleagues say customer, just go, just do a, a little rap on the, on the table or the bar so they'll know. Now here's the gold, that's not the gold. And I tell them this stuff. I involve them in the thought process and the strategy of why we do things. That is not the gold, that is obvious. Here's the gold. If you say the word customer and you hear the knocking, you have two choices. You can be that Cro-Magnum man that gets upset because you didn't do something perfectly and then your brain reinforces the negativity and now it's a pain point or you can realize this is awesome. This is an opportunity to get better and closer to my staff and the team and to change a behavior and become more. That's what I hope for you. I hope when you hear that knock, you get excited. And when we frame it that way, we don't have the resistance to the change because that's the biggest thing you fight when you try to teach a new staff how to do things differently. They're married, they're attached to that piece that you want to change. So anything you can do to reframe it without embarrassing, but make the group decide and agree and police that effort, that's where I find a lot of, uh, a lot of success. Contrary to what one inexplicably popular show from America on Bar Consulting says, you cannot walk into a room, motherfucker everyone, and then walk out and expect them all to want to do the change that you created. Now, I don't say win hearts and minds because I think winning implies some sort of battle or struggle or victory. Someone wins, someone loses. I always, when I walk in a room, I feel it is my duty first and foremost to earn people's hearts and minds. As a trainer in the bar world, I tried to find something really simple but kind of that would blow their minds that they would realize 
this isn't like every other training I've been in. We've all been there. You gotta get up on a day off super early, like the crack of noon, and go into work, and then have some rep come in and try to teach you about their spirit or their bartending, and you're just like, God, I got out of bed for this. And I know that's in their mind. So when I walk in and I do a training, my thing was to do technical free pouring. And that was a way to show them there is a way without using any other tool, just a pour spout, to pour quickly and precisely without spilling that you may not have ever learned that I want to share with you. And within about 30 minutes, now I've, got, I've earned their minds and I earned their hearts or tried to by listening. And when I say listening, I mean like, for example, I walked in to do a union reclassification at a very famous resort in the U.S. called the Greenbrier. And I've been training for 15 years. And I walked in, and it's all these bartenders that are in their mostly 50, 60s and 70s, some in their 50s, a couple in their 40s. And I walked into the room, and they were all like this. Every one of them. And I tried to start my training. I got about a minute and a half in, and I stopped, and I said, all right, what's going on? They're like, what? I'm like, what, what's the, this, I've done this a number of times. What, what's the problem? What's wrong? And the shop steward spoke up and he said, it's not you. I apologize. It's just we've all been here 30, 40 years. You're like the 15th consultant to come in to tell us how to do our jobs better. Nothing ever changes. Management doesn't listen. This is a waste of time. We'd all rather be with our families. I said, well, what, what isn't management doing? What do you want? And they laughed. And I said, hang on. And I started whiteboarding, and I wrote down the list. What else? What else do you want? What else do you want? Wrote down everything that hadn't been done for the last 20 years. I said, stay right here. I'll be right back. Picture the list. Went over to Gunnard Cunningham's office, the F&B. I sat down. I said, you know that thing you want? You know how you want to get this union property to accept performance-based scheduling, which unions don't do? I said, I can get it for you. You got to give me this fast. He said, let's go take a walk down to the golf club and see if we can redesign that bar over the weekend and fix that service bar they all hate. And we got them and we ordered tools, everything right away. Came back in and I said, guys, it's Friday. Give me till Monday afternoon. Just follow me on this training. Give me till Monday afternoon. If I don't get you some of the things you've never had, you guys can tune out. You can go home and be with your families and I'll just figure something else out. Earning heart sometimes isn't just about having weeks and months to get to trust and know people. Sometimes it's just, I think it's about breaking the construct, the fake dynamic we think we're supposed to have and just getting real and saying, what's wrong? Like, what? Oh, nothing, man. I'm fine. I'm just hung over. I was out until three in the morning last night. Oh, okay. Uh, dry mocking. This was something we came up years ago in competitions. When you do an opening or I do one, um, I used to travel and guest bartend a lot. And I don't mean like the guest bartending where you show up like eight minutes late and you make like one pre-batch cocktail that you pour out of a pitcher and smile for the camera. I mean where you show up to a bar you've never worked in and you get back there and you pull a full shift and you ring things in and you're not a superstar, you're just some dude from somewhere else or some lady from somewhere else. Well, the survival technique that I learned from competing in speed competitions that I would use there is to go in early when no one's there and dry mock the drinks from their menu. Because like most people, I have a really hard time, I can memorize a drink recipe, but then when I go behind a bar, it's like, I don't know where any of this shit is. So the first thing I would do is, and dry mocking is basically, there's two versions. And I do this with all my trainees because it saves so much on product cost and time. And what I have them do is they make the drinks at real speed, pantomiming, and grabbing every object but not pouring it. So they grab the glass, they pretend to ice it up, they pick up the gin, the Campari, and the sweet vermouth, and they show and they say, that, and if they're using a jigger, then fine, they say what the amounts are out loud, they do the whole process so that I can correct them or we can correct each other before they waste the product and the time of resetting the whole station. So that's one version, do you guys do that? A few people, cool. Here's the really crazy, weird version that tricks the brain. You learn things faster when you chunk them. For example, put your pens down. I want everyone to remember this. 702-363-0951, right? What if I said 702-363-0951? Phone numbers, at least in my country, are chunked so that you remember them better. If I asked you to remember a string of 900 letters 
in random order, probably only Jacob Breyers could do that. But if I put them into words and sentences, we could all learn them very easily, and we have, and we will learn a song. So this dry mocking technique, what you do, you can do it anywhere. You can do it on a bus, on a plane. If you're going in to do a round of drinks for a competition or behind your bar, or you're practicing for a new job or a training, you make the drink faster than humanly possible. You say it as fast as you possibly can. So you go, glass, ice, gin, half an ounce, uh, three quarters ounce, three quarters Campari, three quarters sweet vermouth. Oh wait, Naren's in the room. Ounce and a, sorry, ounce of gin, duh. Uh, lemon, orange, sorry, glass, napkin, boom, done. The faster you say that, your brain starts to know it has to be on a higher gear and faster, and you remember better and faster. You also learn where the hiccups are. And you'll find if you do this with a complex series of any moves, whether it's in dance, anything, you immediately know the areas you have to slow down and focus on where you're stumbling instead of doing the whole thing and keep making the same mistake. You can then zone in on that one mistake to improve it. Here's the hardest thing I took me 10 years to solve for in training, right? You get into a training environment, you, tra you train bartenders all these skills, whatever they are, it's great. Then you put them behind a working, breathing restaurant or bar or club and tons of people walk in and the shit just all goes out the window. And they're looking at their sneakers and everyone's stressed out. My biggest thing was how do I get these young or new bartenders to get their heads up all the time? So in training, day one, I introduce a lemon and I say, I'm gonna have this lemon. Pretty much from now on, whenever you see me, I will have a lemon. It is your job to always know where the lemon is. And so they start doing whatever drill we're doing, whatever training, something procedural. And I very, don't make it, I just take a lemon and I just like set it down. And then I go, all right, everyone stop, point to the lemon. And 14 hands go in 14 directions. I keep doing it, by the end of the day, where's the lemon? 14 hands all point to it. I'm trying to weaponize the workflow with something that is going to happen in service that you can't really train for because they're learning all this new information, they're hyper-focused. I'm teaching the habit of having terrible awareness when I'm training because they're like this the whole time. I can't have that. As the drill evolves, what we end up doing is saying, all right, your next round, I want you to make that perfect round of cocktails in two and a half minutes, and I want you to tell me what happened in the room when you're done. It's really hard for them at first. After a week of training, they get better and better, and now we've created a habit as a team, as a culture, and now that's how you germinate a culture with the service standards you want, is you think about the things that no one ever really spends time on. And that's kind of the irony, which I'll get to in a second, is I think hospitality is the number one piece of that. We, we all talk about hospitality, up and down, left and right. It's in every article now. When's the last time you were in a lineup and instead of talking about the specials of the day, someone said, so what are we gonna do today to improve our hospitality? What's something we can all do? And actually talked about something. I'm sure Nectali does. I know I've been to his restaurant. And I'm sure a lot of you do, but not enough people do. Uh, just one thing too, how many people in this room think they're a pretty good trainer? But you don't, don't have to be shy or fake humble, who's a pretty good trainer? Yeah, everyone's, everyone that trains, they'll just ask the, them, they'll say, I'm a, I'm a good trainer. There's only one metric for how good of a trainer you are in anything in life. Did your students learn? If they didn't learn, it's my fault, not theirs. Every time, no exceptions. Here's a couple books I love. Sorry that they're all English, I know that for some of you that's a second language. Uh, here's a book that's really not very valuable and I wouldn't bother buying it. It's not that good. It's also not for sale because it's done. It's, it's just not published. It's written. It's edited. It's ready to go. But it's not that great. But don't worry. I'll, I'll bore you a little bit about it. So moving on to hospitality, speaking of which, everyone read this book? Who hasn't read this book? Show me your hands. Read this book. It's the Bible. It's one of the best books ever written on the subject of hospitality and what it means, what it feels like, and how to, how to create it and culturize it. And here's a really crappy book on the same subject that you cannot buy yet. But it hinges on a thought I have. I'm not, I'm just, I've never said this next slide to anyone. I want your honest reaction. If you agree with this, I want you guys to clap. If you don't, cross your arms and look mad. I really want to pull you guys. This is my basic theory on hospitality. This is terrifying. 
If you agree with it, clap. If you disagree, which is fine, cross your arms and give me a dirty look, please. No? Okay. So what I want to do real quick here is just, mm, let's see, 50. I'm going to break this down as fast as I can. The basic theory isn't complicated. It's the ability to have a conversation with a large group of people and actually get a result to improve revenue and hospitality without spending more money. So a service progression allows for great service, but the hospitality, much how music is what happens between the notes, hospitality has to happen between those steps of service, and all of us focus on those steps of service hoping there's time for that magical dialogue that you can't script for that is hospitality. So how do we possibly improve hospitality without putting less money in the register, without putting more bartenders on? How do we do both at the same time? The logical thought to me was, we need to shorten these steps. We need to be more efficient with these steps of service. And if we do that, we create more spaces for the staff, those great people you hired, to be able to add in more conversation, more guest reading, more hospitality. And in fact, in this day and age, if we can remove a few steps like ringing and tendering and automate, we create more room for hospitality. Or if that's not our goal, if we simply just be more efficient with these steps, then we can actually produce more drinks, more sales, same amount of hospitality, or like in some environments, if we can only have time at peak volume for nonverbal hospitality, for warmth and energy and smiles and handshakes and laughs, we can really throttle that throughput which allows us to double and triple sales. So when I show people slides where I improve the, the sales volume of a venue more than 200%, people say, bullshit. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Here's the sales mix summaries, and this is the system we use to do it. As a team, we got together and said, what venue are we, and what are we trying to solve for? Are we talking about hospitality during peak volume? Are we talking about when it's slow? Or... Is it a different framing? Is it talking about the style of the venue? If we don't define what the standard is specifically in ways that we can work on, we don't ever get any better at it. It's like, let's just all go out there and be hospitable and show them things in off days, but we don't weaponize them into the workflow. That's always where my brain is. And then we enlarge the problem area and think, well, wait a minute, if you want to do that, why didn't we think about the shape of the bar or where it was put in the room in order to have all of these very important things that get to the customer journey? <clears throat> yeah, guest. In order to get to the guest journey, why don't we think about these things in the design phase and be smarter about why we are pick, making the decisions we're making instead of just saying, you know what, I think the bar would look good in that corner. But for most of us, what we're focusing on is that singular step of production, which brings us to pretty much my last slide on bar design. So whenever you get into a space where people are allowed to start having some say in design, the first natural thing that happens is customization. And customization is the idea, I want everything. I want all the options I never had. How many bartenders in this room have worked behind a bar where you hate the setup? The equipment, the design, it's difficult, it hurts your body, you could be so much faster if it were just moved. So the first chance, how many people have had an opportunity to have say in the bar they work behind in the design? Show of hands. Do you remember the first time it happened? Isn't it awesome? And didn't you ask for every fucking thing possible? All right, so what I want, I want hydraulics here, and I want the glasses to come up here. They're going to feed from a track in the back, and it's going to be... That's customization. It's where you have to start. you got to get it out of your system. That's the phase we're in right now, and it's exciting because we never had this. No bartender ever designed a bar I ever heard of the first 15, 20 years of my career, and now it is literally happening all over the world, especially here in Europe. This is all customization. And by the way, big round of applause for the person I know that started it the earliest and inspired me the most back in 2005 when I walked into his bar in London and walked behind it and saw that a company decided to manufacture his ideas into a station. The maestro, Salvatore Calabrese. Can we get a little? Optimization is figuring out what is the ideal solution for where we want to be to get the most things done. And that's just trying to make me look smart. Fitz Law basically says that if you want to make things easier to use, you put them closer to the person and make them larger. That's it. Hicks Law says too many choices stresses people out. 
decision fatigue sets in, it's harder to make the decision. You get rid of those two things, you get an elegant, optimized solution that is actually smarter, intuitive, and faster. So when we're talking about ergonomics, we're not just saying, well, I think it should be this way. We're looking to the laws that already exist that dictate ergonomics and thinking, how do we optimize? Otherwise, we end up with feature creep. This is feature creep. This is, I want every possible tool I could ever have near me because one day I might need it. Instead of optimizing the design to exactly what we need when we need it. And that combined with always asking how can I make bartenders faster, more comfortable, and not sacrifice quality of drink led to this, what I hope is a somewhat optimized design for a bartender station. If you guys want to do more design, get into it. Here's two books I recommend. I can't come into Germany and talk about design. I shouldn't do that at all. Without mentioning Dieter Rams. So Dieter Rams is a genius. If you're not familiar with him, he pretty much took all these ideas and created how we design products these days. I've got a couple more. I'm just going to fly through. One of the things I'm doing right now is I'm traveling the world, being really lonely and unpopular, trying to innovate in the construction, architectural, design, interior design, and food service industries by telling these people, walking into a room and saying, you know that thing you guys all think is right? <laughs> I think it's wrong. <laughs> we can change it. Uh, I'm very unpopular. I'm a little bit unpopular. I'm trying to tell them all the solution to designing smarter bars is so fucking simple and it's right in front of you. Get a bartender involved in the design process. So I'm trying to get these companies to look at hiring just like the spirits companies have brand ambassadors, bartenders who can be involved early in the process and help make smarter decisions for the design. We've got one hired, we've got a woman in Chicago who's been hired, Tori Gotsis, who is phenomenal. We're trying to find more people, companies that will hire them. If you guys can help me, this is my way of trying to make the pie bigger and not worry about, I gotta get all the design jobs. How can I make more opportunities for bartenders to design equipment, to design bars, to design the entire environment? And that's something that, to me, that's a definition of success. The last thing on that piece I'll say is, careful of the dogma of success. Success dictates that you're supposed to have a staff and that you don't work or you're just a leader and they do all the work. And I bought into this for a long time and I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying it was wrong for me. The day I realized that my joy is creating things out of my head and that I love doing that by myself and then bringing those ideas to people and then sharing with people in that way is the day that my happiness went through the roof and so did my business. I drive a 10 year old car but I also get on a plane and go anywhere the hell I want in the world whenever I want and I take my little iPad with me and do all my work on it. That was a goal for success for me. One of my goals I stated to myself 20 years ago is I wanna live out of a backpack. I wanna have a house, but I wanna be able to live out of a backpack and work out of a backpack. Don't let the rest of the industry tell you what successful means. Pick the life you want and do it. And then I'm just gonna skip to this last slide with books. These are three books if you want to be a better person, whoops, that I just flew right by. Uh, questions while we have a minute. Sorry for the anticlimactic final, but these are three books that changed my life as a human being. If you're trying to, wondering specific ways you could become a better human or you want your staff to be or your spouse or... No, if you want to explore that, um, these, these three books change the way I see the world and the way that I engage with people that I couldn't figure out on my own because I am not only clumsy physically, I'm clumsy in a lot of ways. Does anyone have any questions at all? We got a time for maybe one or two. Anybody? You guys aren't real talkers. Not a lot of questions. Nobody? Sweet. Well, then we're finished. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you got that one idea. I hope one little. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobin. And if anybody wants to grab him for a quick question before he goes, grab him quick.